Thanks very much for the uh, opportunity to talk to you today. So I'm going to be talking about some work we've been developing here at Curtin on um, fast laser ablation, um, where we're uh, using rapid um, rapid ablation to crunch through detrital zircon uh, samples. So I'd uh, I'd like to start off and give a little bit about uh, the background to um, geochronology and why uh, more rapid ablation offers some um, interesting um, opportunities for the science but also offers some economic benefits as well and how it's um, applicable to reducing exploration risk by rapidly producing geochronology to help us understand where we are in stratigraphy. So um, traditionally with uh, geochronology um, we've been aiming more and more for higher precision um, uh, analyses. So that's basically the idea here. Precision is normal uh, bell curve, normal distribution, and we're reducing the, um, reducing the uncertainty here. And obviously we want accurate analyses. So if this is the true value we want, um, the precision, um, we want high precision, so a small uncertainty, but we also want to be accurate, so overlapping the true value. So in geochronology, we've typically, through um, years and years and more high resolution um, instrumentation, been aiming for high precision and high accuracy. Of course, if we have high precision and low accuracy, the opportunity would be with reference material to correct this to the true value. The um, the traditional notion of geochronology has been usually based around um, magmatic samples where there's been this concept that everything should conform to a normal distribution. So on the right hand side here we've got images of um, various normal distributions with different standard deviations but the idea principally has been zircon growth is instantaneous um, in our magma therefore more and more analyses should um, uh, combined together to give us a more precise um, uh, um, answer, so in other words a smaller degree of uncertainty. Um, and that kind of works on this uh, scaling factor here where with more analyses we're going to increase um, we're going to increase the um, precision, so we're going to um, have a smaller degree of uncertainty with more and more analyses, but it's not a linear function, so it's a law of decreasing returns. So as we get more, uh, more and more analyses, we're going to see um, less and less benefit in terms of more precision. This actually, the scaling function is very similar to um, what we expect within a uh, standard normal distribution population, which is described by this um, MSWD value, which basically is for geochronologists a way of expressing excess dispersion. So where we've got a large number of analyses, we would be expecting an MSWD of one. Um, if we had a value greater than one, we would be basically saying there was um, either underestimated uncertainties or over dispersion within the data. Conversely, on the other side, if we've got a very low MSWD value, there would be an indication that the data was um, under dispersed or the um, uncertainties were overestimated. But the point is this kind of scaling function where you get more analyses, you basically um, are gaining precision, but you're gaining it at a law of diminishing returns. But the kind of question here is, is this really um, what's going on with uh, a lot of the geology do we see? We know, for example, that zircon growth isn't instantaneous. In fact, um, these different models from left to right here, we've got a range of um, pseudo-section derived um, equilibrium models where we've got uh, various types of granitic magma crystallizing so temperature on the um, bottom axis here so we're cooling towards the left in each one of these magmas and we're crystallizing different phases so we've got a liquid in this gray this liquid in the gray then um, decreases in terms of volume because we're getting plagioclase quartz and clay feldspar growing but we're also starting to precipitate zircon at about for example 900 degrees when we've got about a thousand ppm zirconium 
at 900 degrees, we originally we start to crystallize zircon, but that crystallization crystallization of zircon isn't instantaneous and occurs over a range of temperature. So we shouldn't really should we really expect a normal um, distribution of zircon. The other point is that we can also have late stage growth of zircon and that's in a more mafic magma when we have things like ilmenite that have these corona of zircon grains where the zirconium has um, exolved from the ilmenite and this is typically a late stage process. So what I actually think uh, geochronology could be heading towards is situations like this where we have high precision, but we're actually able to understand these outliers better. These outliers may reflect prolonged zircon growth situations, so we're actually able to estimate how long a magma might grow, but in other situations these outliers might tell us about other geological processes, and this is relevant when we come to consider things like detrital zircon geochronology, because what we're trying to do there is minimize sources of bias and get the most representative detrital zircon fingerprint, that signature that we're interested in comparing to source regions. So um, for example, here's a range of different detrital zircon signatures we've generated here at Curtin to look at the um, Eucla Basin. But a key question here is, are the heights, the relative heights of these um, mesoproterozoic peaks relative to Archean peaks, does that actually reflect the uh, volumetric um, amount of material in the source region? If it did, that would allow us to reconstruct paleogeographies, or does it reflect some selective biases in the geological environment? So those selective biases can be geological, you know, the fertility, selective erosion, sorting effects, selective upgrading, or even just the loss of grains because they became, they're, you know, the original source was more metamic, it was more uh, uranium enriched. But onto these geological biases, which we might actually be able to gain information about their geology through, there's also a range of analytical biases. Those analytical biases have been quite well demonstrated to come from a range of different processes. One of the most uh, significant, perhaps, is just the process of hand picking. So, for picking individual grains, putting them onto a mine to analyze, we've already demonstrated that. This can introduce a significant bias. The example here shows a bulk mounted example where all the grains were thrown on a mount, there was no selective picking, and there's a statistically significant difference between these two age spectra that were collected. So if we want to minimize some of these laboratory biases, we could potentially tr uh, try this uh, fast ablation approach, and that's what I'd um, like to, to talk to you about. Um, so fast ablation basically aims to reduce our analytical time and to get through more analyses. The reason this is um, relevant is because it's being pointed out um, the number of grains to characterize a population is basically it ever increases and it ever increases because it really depends on the geological complexity of the system so it can't really be predicted a priori. So for example in 1988 a good rule of thumb was you wanted 60 grains well, by 2004, we wanted 117 grains, and more recent work in 2014 says 300 grains are necessary. The reality of these is these are just simplistic models to estimate the number of grains you need. They can't really be predicted because it depends on the complexity of the geology that we're trying to capture in our detrital zircon spectra. What is interesting, though, is if we have a single basement component, of course, we only need one analysis to characterize it. But we have, if we have a complex basement component with multiple age components, we also obviously need more analyses to characterize that. But statistic is our, statistics is our friend here, because it says no matter what, the most dominant um, detrital component or the most dominant um, component, even with a small n sampling, should be the most dominant source. That's why even small n detrital zircon data sets can be powerful. Okay, so let's quickly look at a, um, a case study that we've recently done with um, uh, Minex, and we've gone to the uh, northern side of the uh, Yilgarn Craton and off east of the, uh, the Archean Pilbara Craton to look at the Neoproterozoic Yunina uh, and Officer Basins in northwestern Australia. Uh, so there's a range of different um, existing sample material here, but we also have material from a range of drill cores. 
the fast ablation approach basically dictates that we bulk mount to reduce picking bias and sample separation bias. So we're throwing um, all our heavy mineral phases onto a epoxy mount. We're then scanning that mount to find all the zircon grains within that. We're not doing any pre-selection of zircon grains, so we're not looking at images um, to target the best parts of grains. We're just hitting every grain in the center. Um, we're using a high, frequent, a high uh, laser frequency to allow us to use a very short laser pulse time. We're bypassing the um, squib, so the homogenization device, so the gas is going straight into the mass spec from the laser. It's not being homogenized, and that allows us to have very fast uh, signal wash-in and wash-out times. This is just an image of a TEMA, um, uh, where we've color-coded the different grains. Okay, so, um, uh, as I said, using drill core to sample this stratigraphy and with a range of different um, sedimentary samples taken throughout the stratigraphy with the hope that we could fing fingerprint different parts of the stratigraphy to understand source to sink relationships but perhaps also help erect a stratigraphy in this quite um, complex and covered basin system. Um, it's a, I should say it's a neoproterozoic basin system and forms part of the Centralian super basin. Um, I want to remove this so I can have it pop up. Sorry about that. Um, basically, what we have here is a comparison between our normal laser ablation split stream work against our fast pulse uh, laser ablation work. So, statistically, using a KS test, there is no um, difference between these um, populations. So that's great. Our fast ablation seems to be able to directly reproduce our um, normal laser ablation um, spectra, except we've done it in a order of magnitude faster time. There is some interesting things to point out, though. Um, I just draw your attention to the ends. So we did 300 analyses here of that. Um, 90 are concordant, 87 are concordant, whereas here, most of the analyses that were shot were concordant. So why are we getting a large, larger proportion of more discordant grains? The, um, one of the reasons you might think about that is because we're not doing any um, pre-abrasion cleaning pulses. Maybe we're getting more common lead. Um, that isn't actually the case. Um, we know that's not the case because there is no isotopic trends to indicate surface contamination. And that was what this um, diagram was going to show you basically if we look at the fast ablations on the left versus the conventional analyses on the right um, where the orange one is the conventional analysis you can see there is no difference in the degree of um, discordance when we've shot exactly the same grain so the point here is that because we're not shooting exactly the same grains, that's part of the reason there's been pre-selection here. So there's a bias that's gone on. We've preferentially, by looking at the grains and doing our conventional technique, we've biased and, protect and um, selected better grains. Not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just uh, the reality. So the, ha the fact that there's more discordant grains here is actually a function of the true population having more discordant grains within it. And that's probably a better reflection of the true geological diversity. Okay, so I guess we better also talk about precision because we touched on that in the start. So with um, uh, we can talk about precision in the uranium lead system and what we would expect to see is that at higher uranium concentrations we've got more counts so therefore more precision. And for shrimp work that's actually what we see. So more uranium, better count rates, and increase in precision. But for laser ablation work, that doesn't appear to be the case. And I want to point out that we're actually doing pretty good here with our uncertainties relative to other techniques. There is an order of my, there's a large volume difference, of course, between SIMS techniques and the laser techniques. But the conventional approach is this green fit. So what's going on here with higher uranium content, we're actually getting more um, uncertainty in our uranium lead system. Why is that? Well, that's probably a function simply of higher uranium grains being more metamic and being more heterogeneous, so they're not sputtering as well. They're essentially falling apart. And because we're using a laser technique, we're sampling a larger volume, so that's more of an effect 
than with um, shrimp work. Shrimp work's only sampling a small volume, so it's not going through as much heterogeneous material and benefiting from the higher counts with higher uranium. Here, we're going into more metamic material, and that's um, causing um, us to lose some precision. Fast pulse is interesting. So our fast pulse um, is actually the highest precision in the uranium lead system, and that's a function of the collectors being saturated very rapidly. It's also a slightly smaller volume than the uh, conventional approach, and therefore we're actually benefiting because we're not sampling as much of the metamic material at high uranium content. So this is something that's really worth considering and looking and knowing that our precision is actually better when we're doing fast pulse work. It seems counterintuitive, but um, there's a lot of data there that suggests that. Also, I need to speak about accuracy. Um, the accuracy of the uh, fast pulse work is outstanding. Um, when we reduce the data using appropriate matrix match standards, we can see we can get um, identical ages to the expected values. So GJ1, when it's reduced against 91,500, yields an age identical with an uncertainty to the expected value. And Manitsoc and OG1, these are two Archean reference materials. When they're reduced using each other, you get um, exactly the um, right or the expected values. Okay, so back to our case study on the right hand side, you can see the large number of probability density plots we produced with the fast uh, ablation work. This was all pretty rapid, it was over um, a couple of sessions, but it was uh, relatively uh, able to be rapidly produced. And we can see we can pick up the main detrital peaks in the region so we get some indication of an arcane component, probably from the Pilbara or Yilgarn material, possibly coming out of the rudal complex. And then there's Proterozoic components, which are widespread across Western Australia, reflecting bits of the Musgrave or Albany Fraser origin. With this amount of data, we need to start thinking about um, um, ways of capturing this information that isn't visual. So we can use multi-dimensional scaling and highlight, you know, different directions on this diagram indicate source components of different ages. Um, we have a small uh, component that's probably more distally derived and, you know, we can invoke things like these transcontinental river systems that brought more distal material. The general take home message though is that there seems to be a large degree of recycling within the basin system itself with only a minor input of more exotic material. That degree of uh, intra-recycling intra indicates a lot of these source components were there from the start of the development of this neoproterozoic basin system. Okay, so very quickly, the take home message for this is uh, the fast pulse bulk combined approach takes 15 seconds on analysis. Routine laser ablation analysis takes about um, 100 seconds, whereas a standard shrimp analysis takes 15 minutes. So you can see there's an order of magnitude difference here. Um, this means that high end data sets, i.e., 300 grains, can be done in um, 75 minutes for our. Um, fast pulse approach, 500 minutes for a traditional approach, and 4,500 minutes for shrimp. So 60 fast pulse analyses for seven conventional analyses or one shrimp analysis. The point of this as well is that we don't see any loss in uranium lead precision. It's highly comparable to the other methods, but we have demonstrated that it um, provides more representative sampling when combined with the bulk mounting approach. The greater discordance is not a function of the technique itself as much as a function of actually better um, capturing the nature of the data set itself. And perhaps this um, discordance data itself can be informative. For example, we have seen in areas where we get into higher fault density that discordance goes up. So this is actually capturing extra geological information. We think this is a powerful technique and perhaps better suited to um, a lot of uh, detrital zircon work where we're trying to capture information about um, this, the, to fingerprint the source to help erect this stratigraphy. Um, thanks very much for letting me chat to you guys.